called an equalization tax. <laughs> so we're live on YouTube. Uh, once again, good morning. It's 11.30. We'll take another 30 seconds before we go formal. Uh, uh, so let's uh, uh, just ask one more question to Jaydeet. Uh, so how do you spend your time nowadays, Jaydeet? Are you reading a lot? Are you speaking a lot? I am indeed speaking a lot, but um, you know, surprisingly, I've become more busy than what we used to be earlier. Uh, and that's primarily because there is no commute. I think there has been a switch in the way people uh, live and do business, which means more can be done digitally without even stepping out. And my office uh, is in Gurgaon while I live in uh, Delhi. And if people who are familiar with the geography will realize that it's at least a one and a half hour commute each way. So I'm saving three hours of commute which also means that I'm working three hours more every day. Uh, so it seems that I'm, I'm busier than what I used to be earlier. Fantastic. It's time to go live. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 26th episode of the Yogananda Guru series, sponsored by Shulini University. Once again, we are back 1130 sharp. We have an amazing speaker today, Dr. Jaijit Bhattacharya. Jajit has been a very dear friend for many, many years. So we actually went to IIT together. Uh, we've known each other, I think, now for 30 years or more than that, 32 years, Jajit. We shouldn't be giving our ages away, but I guess I did already. Uh, a brilliant speaker, a brilliant person, but most importantly, a great human being. Jajit is also, he's, he's had senior positions with uh, consulting firms like Anderson Consulting, KPMG, with Hewlett Packard, HP. Uh, uh, he now runs his own set of businesses. He's on multiple think tanks. He almost joined the government of India in a position of a secretary. Lots and lots of accolades for JG. He's also, by the way, on Shulani's Global Advisory Board, uh, adjunct faculty at IIT Delhi, uh, has taught at NCR. Oof. You know, how do you do all of this stuff? We'll uh, talk about that separately, Jaiji. But the topic for the today uh, for today is India's independence, India's sovereignty as a country. So I'm going to read from uh, Rabindranath's very famous poem, where the mind is without fear. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not broken up into fragments, where tireless striving stretches in arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit. So he's talking about freedom. He's talking about a world where the knowledge is free. And the question is, will we be free as a nation? Will we be sovereign as a nation without technological sovereignty? Yes, politically we are. But how dependent are we to China, to the US, to Russia, to other countries? And that's the topic that Jayajit is going to talk to us today. So I won't take more time. I'm going to hand it over to Jayajit for a fascinating 40 minute journey into this absolutely amazing talk. Over to you, Jayajit. Again, lots of questions uh, that we want to answer uh, for all of you. So please don't hesitate to start asking questions, keep commenting and uh, for both people on Zoom and YouTube, once again, welcome to the Yogananda Guru series. Over to you, Jayajit Bhattacharya. Thank you, Atul, and a uh, very good morning to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure to be on this forum. And I'll start by completing the poem that uh, Atul was reciting uh, from the Nobel laureate uh, Ramana Tagore's poem. It ends by saying, and into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. So it is in that state where we truly have freedom in all the dimensions, where we are clearly in control of our destiny, of our lives, of how we work, of how we live. Uh, on, only when we achieve that level of freedom is when we have actually achieved true freedom. And without that, we are actually living in a uh, suboptimal ecosystem where we don't have control over our own destinies. And that's what we are really focused on, focusing on in today's talk. Um, so I'll, I'll start by sharing a, a presentation that I've put together for today's talk. And um, just give me a minute while I figure out the technology involved. I hope all of you can see my screen now. Um, 
We can Please see you, Jaijin. Confirm that, need to put it uh, that yes. you could see my. Uh, it's working, Jaijin, and uh, you need to put it on screen uh, on on slideshow. It's it's working. We you lost you now. It was up there in a sec a second. Yeah, it's it's there. Lovely. Okay, can you see it now? Perfect, Jaijin. Please go ahead. Great. So, um, as the topic today is where knowledge is free, and um, I basically borrowed it from the poem of uh, of Ramana Tagore because it really captures what we are really trying to say today. And let me start by talking about what is colonization and um, and why colonization and access to knowledge are so intertwined. I have put together this definition. This definition really doesn't exist, but um, I haven't come across anybody who disagrees with this definition. It defines colonization as extraction of economic benefit from an area of influence through manipulation of the rules of engagement, through either force or deceit. And we had three stages of such colonization. We had social colonization, <clears throat> we had political military colonization, and now we are in a phase of technological colonization. So what was the social colonization? Social colonization was when within the same society, you had upper classes trying to control the lower classes. You had the same in Europe, you had the same in, uh, with, the, with the Native Americans in, in America, you had the same with Indonesians in Indonesia, and you had the same with Indians in India, where you had uh, various strata of the society. And somehow the, the people at the top of that strata uh, were able to extract more economic benefit from the society than everybody else. And that would happen because they would say that we have got our powers from God or we have got powers from the fact that we are lords or, or we are uh, knights and so on and so forth. And therefore they would get large parts of lands and, and uh, essentially exploit the rest of the society. That gave way to what we typically call as the political military colonization, where entire countries were subjugated by other countries who thought that they were superior, and therefore they could extract more economic benefit out of the subjugated colonies. And uh, the classic case being India being subjugated by, uh, by, by Britain for a very long time. And once that colonization got over, what we have run into is something that I'm calling as technological colonization, which is which is a term I coined about 15 years back. Um, and what exactly is technological colonization? It is a state where I really don't have control over any of the fundamental basic technologies, which is what is related to essentially knowledge. And we don't have control over knowledge, we don't have control over technology, either because we simply don't know about it and it's, and it's completely controlled or because there are patents and copyrights and other kinds of so-called global regulations of engagement, the rules of engagement that prevents us from accessing these technologies. Now, has India ever done the other way around? Has India been on the, on the side where we subjugated the rest of the world to technological colonization? And the answer is actually yes. Surprisingly, where were the inventors of technological colonization? We controlled the production of, of zinc, the technology that controlled the production of zinc. And as all of, all of you know, um, zinc is a very important component of bronze. So in the bronze age civilization and the derivative, which is brass, was actually dependent on high quality zinc and therefore high quality bronze could only be, be created if you had clean, pure zinc being put in. And that is a technology that we control because zinc melts at a certain temperature and in the next three degrees, it ends up vaporizing. So if you can't capture it, you lose zinc. And that was a technology we control. And there are zillions of technologies that India controlled, which is where we were actually the inventor of technological colonization. And it now appears that we are on the receiving end of that same regime that at some point in time we had created. So what is, digital colonization and um, you know I had moved from the word digital colonization to technological colonization because I was accused of being jingoistic. And the reason I chose these words about 15 years back is because we really had to shake up people to understand what's really going on. It is not a free world. It is not a free trade that's going on. There is very deep involvement of governments to control technology, to control standards, 
and therefore to extract disproportionate economic benefit. I'm sure many of you have heard about um, the, uh, the, the profits that um, iPhone gets from its manufacturing. Uh, it's a very small portion that goes into actual manufacturing of let's say a $1,000 um, iPhone, and that's perhaps the cheapest iPhone that exists out there. And out of that $1,000, not more than $200 actually goes into, into production, into the cost of actually manufacturing it. And that's as per popular information that's out there. The balance $800 actually goes into profits. And that's a huge amount of uh, extraction of value that is going on. And that's not just iPhone. And, and uh, I have no intention of singling out any one company. That is the nature of the new trade regime that we are in for the last 40, 50 years. And the way it starts is that an intellectual property is created and which is then patented and, and I, or copyrighted. And then this push through international standards to, to make it an international standard so that if somebody comes in later, they will not be part of the ecosystem unless they use the same standard that is so-called international standard. And once they start using it, then the entity which created those standards and therefore has got submarine patents around it and, and has got a complete control over those, those standards, either through the rules uh, that are there or through the control of the ecosystem, then starts charging an unfair amount of money for those standards to be used, which is what I'm calling as unfair rent on IPR and essentially it's antitrust. And that money is then pumped in again to create the next generation of technologies. And it's very simply, you can see it in the laptops and screens that you're using to watch this particular session. Every couple of years, your, your machine starts behaving in uh, as if it's, it's slowed down. It, uh, and somebody comes and tells you that it's obsolete and you upgrade your machine and voila, what do you end up doing? You end up doing exactly the same thing that you were doing four or five years back. You're still making the same spreadsheets. You're still doing the same presentations. You're still writing on the same word processing software, but you have to change everything and you have to pump in a huge amount of money to do that upgrade, so-called upgrade. And everything is version next that comes out without you really benefiting out of it or you having any control or say on whether you want to upgrade or not. Because if you do not, you will get deprived from your work and from your ability to be productive and so on and so forth without anything underlying fundamentally changing. And that is how more economic benefits are getting extracted. Uh, and the side effect also is that we are, we are leading to huge amount of electronic waste being created and we all are aware of the toxicity of the electronic waste that gets created. And, and that essentially is what is digital colonization. And it is spread in every aspect of our life. And so what kind of standards and what kind of patents should be allowed? You know, when we are saying that there should not be any control, um, are we talking about a regime where there is absolutely free availability of technology? Well, what we're essentially saying is that there should not be any frivolous patents. You know, I also myself have a bunch of patents, but we could do it. And I was working in IBM Research Lab at some point in time. We could file these patents because we were um, earlier and, and uh, than everybody else, and we could see more than everybody else. But does that give us the right to deny humanity from accessing that same knowledge base, which becomes obvious in a year or two years time? Uh, and, and the popular example that I keep taking is imagine if Edmund Hillary went up uh, Mount Everest and then he turns around and say, hey, I'm the first one who went up Mount Everest. So let me put up a check post every one kilometer as you go up and um, I'll collect taxes because I was the first one to go up. So in, uh, on Mount Everest, you suddenly have eight check posts coming up because that's what Edmund Hillary put in. That's exactly what's happening in technology. Just because somebody has the advantage of, uh, of having visibility to what's coming out next, or has the market control to actually define what will come out next, they go ahead and put these check posts in the name of uh, patents or copyrights and so on and so forth, and denies everybody else from being able to access that technology without paying a rent to the first one who goes in. So as an example, you know, many of you who is watching this show um, are, are smart engineers. If you go ahead and create, let's say, a brilliant prefetch queue in a microprocessor, do you think your technology will then suddenly get adopted in all the processes? 
answer is no because the processes and the ecosystem are controlled by a few technology players and they will define whether they want your technology or not want your technology or whether they would like to use their own technology which is suboptimal to your technology just because you've got control over the ecosystem so you can hold on to your technology and and come out nothing wiser out of it uh, uh, because the, the technology is actually defined by those who control the ecosystem and unfortunately controls countries like india and companies in india do not control the ecosystem and therefore we are not in the forefront of technology in most cases uh, that we can talk about so here is an example of a frivolous patent i think you have all heard of the samsung versus apple play and here is a uh, a screenshot of from new york times which talks about what it essentially was so apple went ahead and sued samsung and what was the issue about well the issue was simply about the fact that samsung had uh, had allegedly copied apple's uh, design and what was apple's design that anything that is flat and has got rounded corners is a design patent of apple and now that is frivolous and i have come across patents of of large companies who have filed patents saying well if there is a power of button on the keyboard and that switches off your laptop or your pc that's a patent that i have now these are frivolous patents it essentially stops innovation from happening and that is what is basically holding us back in our um uh, attainment of uh, leadership in technology and our ability to have a level playing field from uh, the perspective of perspective of technology so a quick comparison of then and now because i'm using the word colonization and here is an explanation of why i'm using the word colonization is because uh, when colonization was happening agreements were signed under innocuous pretexts and were touted as treaties same is happening now we've got trips we've got um, ita the information technology agreement in fact there's ita 1 and ita 2 ita 1 essentially said hey guys you will get a access to free cool technology just don't put any uh, any tax on it which means that you have to import all of this all of these technologies at zero customs so if at all you would like to build your own systems or manufacture them locally uh, you will not be able to do so because somebody who's already manufacturing it will always have a significant benefit and therefore countries like india had their entire electronics manufacturing completely wiped out in fact we were in a situation a few years ago where we were our electronics import bill was pretty close to our our, our oil import bill and our oil import bill is massive and therefore when it came to ita2 which was the next version of ita which said that um, there are a whole bunch of new technologies created and we would like to you to again go in and sign an agreement wherein you will have uh, zero uh, customs duty uh, the the basic customs duty will be zero bcd will be zero on all of this uh, and you will freely import them and therefore never have a ecosystem of uh, of your own manufacturing well india refused and we went in and we argued that look a mobile phone is not the same as smartphone there was no smartphone when it1 was signed so when and under it2 when you brought in smartphones we will not agree to it and we have now started putting a a custom duty on uh, import of uh, manufacturing of manufactured smartphones so in the, in the last 3 to 4 years we have ended up becoming one of the largest manufacturers of smartphones in the world in such a short period of time because we are now able to wrest back control from these treaties and these agreements that were signed off by our predecessors and that's where the issue of of um, of colonization starts coming in um you know just like we had rani lakshmibai uh, not being able to put her adopted son as a as her successor because somewhere some agreement some document said an adopted son can be can cannot become uh, the successor now who signed it who agreed to it uh, was there a united nations at that point in time clearly not did rani lakshmibai actually sign on to that uh, document no we seem to be repeating that kind of situation where we are saying well there's a rule of law but guess what you were never part of drafting the rule of law and under that rule of law will deny you technology in every which way and that is why i coined the term digital colonization uh, and uh, and therefore the issue of technological sovereignty and now this is happening in dvds leds televisions and so on and so forth phones i just mentioned social media and let me take the quick example of dvd because this played out in china and dvds were using a innocuous standard called mp4 where many of you are engineers you will uh, you will assume that mp4 is an open standard 
to be freely used and um, and people kept watching china's ramping up of dvd uh, manufacturing and between two large companies one based in japan and one based in europe that 550 patents on that supposedly open standard called mp4 which actually renders your your video and uh, once china started man- ramping up its manufacturing they came in and said well now you have to pay me royalty for all the manufacturing that you're doing and you have to pay me royalty of around 20 dollars for the manufacturing and when the dvd co- players cost was around uh, 120 dollars 20 dollars could still be afforded and that was a time when china was really trying to get into wto so the chinese government actually made sure that uh, the manufacturers end up paying the royalty pretty soon the the entire manufacturing um uh, the the pricing of dvd crashed to about 40 dollars at walmart they were selling for 40 dollars and the cost of manufacturing was about 18 dollars royalty was 20 dollars uh and um, and therefore the manufacturers ended up having only about 1 to 2 dollars in their pocket for all the effort that they put in and somebody who had only gone up mount everest uh, for once which is i'm talking about these two companies who filed the patents only once simply sat back and were getting benefits out of um, this production of dvds and they were getting massively disproportionate benefits and that is what is the disproportionate economic benefit i'm talking about out of a 40 dollar sale price they were getting 20 dollars for doing nothing and the balance 20 dollar uh, was largely a production cost out of which only 1 to 2 dollar was going as profits and that is what technological sovereignty and digital colonization is all about and let me take another example of um, the industrial revolution as to how patents and copyrights really impacted us and um, you know you would have heard of uh, james watt who is supposed to have invented the steam engine uh, guess what he didn't actually invent the steam engine it was invented by others he was the one who had the ability to go ahead and patent it and because of his control over the parliament he actually expanded or extended his patent for another 30 years and so for a period of 30 years he had complete control over the steam engine as a technology and during that period there was no increase or very limited increase in the efficiency of steam engines which almost led to the steam engines dying out because if the cost of uh, transporting uh, let's say a ton of coal is more than the cost of the of the coal itself because of poor efficiency of the engine it just would not make any sense it's only when the patent of uh, james watt expired did the growth of efficiency of the steam engine actually take off and there was a um a journal that was put together called the lean engine reporter wherein all the engineers freely put in their ideas and that's what led to the efficiency of steam engine really going up and that's when really the industrial revolution took off and the same is for the other pillar of industrial revolution which is uh, bessemerization which is steel production and again till the time that technology was not open sourced steam production uh, steel production just did not go up uh and and therefore if somebody says that patents actually lead to innovation and increase in economic activity that clearly is not true at all so this is where china is now you know we talked about dvd and we talked about china getting the short shrift of uh, what happened uh with the dvd production and and many other productions you know, leds and so on and so forth if you look at this news article which is of 2019 it says china emerges as global technology innovation leader I don't need to impress on all of you that China is really knocking on the doors of technology leadership. And um and 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 how did China really reach here? How did China become a competitor to technology leadership to the established players of US, Europe and Japan? It did not happen overnight. It did not happen um uh, on its own. Uh, it did not happen because there was a few sharp smart Chinese companies it happened because the government woke up way back in 2004 and started pushing china towards technology leadership it was orchestrated it was not organic and guess what this is not just china which orchestrated its technology leadership it was a uh, us who was one of the first ones to orchestrate its technology leadership by actually putting the weight behind telegraph and making it a a, a large industry in us and similarly they did the same thing with railroads and many other technologies right down to semiconductors where the the entire weight of the government was pushed behind the technology leadership 
and only then did these countries including china now which became a leader in uh, technology standards so if you look at uh, what madam wu did in 2004 and she was the vice premier of china which is the second highest ranking official she held around 20 rounds of discussion with dick cheney who was a then vice president of uh, of us on a small standard called wapi wapi is like a wifi standard and many countries including india had alternate standards because our universities and and uh, the iits had professors who had developed their own standards similarly in china one of the professors had developed the wapi standard and what china did was made it mandatory that all production of wifi equipment in china must mandatorily support wapi and that led to this 20 rounds of discussion between madam bu and uh, and dick cheney please keep in mind that at the same time um we had um, uh, jaswant singh who was our then defense minister and um steve talbot who was not as senior an official from the us government had 17 rounds of discussion on the nuclear deal so you can imagine how much more important this little standard of wapi was compared to the nuclear deal and china woke up to realize that unless it has got control over technology it is simply going to be a colony of the of the powers which actually control technology i will continue to build the 200 dollar phones which then get end up uh, selling at 1000 dollars and that was the moment where china started reorienting its policies and really focusing on attaining technology leadership uh, and and that's when i started getting involved in some of the policy making uh that china had uh, started orchestrating at that point and here is a small piece that i wrote again way back in uh, 2006 ish uh on the technology of india and i'll just take one example because we really don't have time uh, to talk about all the examples um at one point in time all our tanks the battle tanks were using one of the motorola processors which of which was suddenly end of life by motorola which means hundreds of crores worth of our tanks will stop working if we don't have that motorola processor so when the mighty government of india went to motorola and begged on its knees to be able to get access to their processor and be able to get supplies of processor motorola simply told them no sorry we cannot give it to you we have end of life and we don't have time for um, you know trying to entertain the request from countries like you so the government of india then went to cd pilani which was one of the leading um, uh, electronics labs in india and um, after a lot of effort which itself is a long story cd pilani was able to um uh, reverse engineer and create the motorola processor on a breadboard and then they went back to the the then department of electronics in government of india to request for funds to actually convert that breadboard based um, processor into an actual semiconductor processor which had to be you know built in either taiwan or some other place and we brought back well the government of india then informed cd pilani that um, look motorola has finally agreed because motorola realized that cd pilani has built this uh, microprocessor and if they don't provide the microprocessor then cd pilani will go ahead and actually build it up and india can actually pose a competition to motorola and um, and therefore government of india told uh, cd pilani that sorry we don't need to spend any more money because motorola has agreed to provide us with the processors Siri Pilani then had a humble request that therefore can our designs be open sourced and provide to all the universities because we spend a huge amount of time and we burn the midnight oil to build this processor and therefore could we actually teach it to uh, our next generation of students um that humble request was also denied because the government thought that that uh, that knowledge base belonged to the government and the example that was given at that point in time was that look Does the government know who owns Taj Mahal? And since it's uh, it's a government property, we can't simply distribute it to people. So you can't distribute your knowledge on a free basis to the universities. And that's just one example. There are hundreds of such examples in India where we were we were in the forefront of technology, and we just could not take that technology leadership, which would have actually put us on a pole position. and therefore can one truly be sovereign if there is no control over future technologies i'll just like to take a, a moments break from the flow and remind you that um you know both atul and i i went to iit kanpur and there were tons of uh, professor who started visiting iit kanpur in the 1960s from us to teach us what is ipr and what is patents and what is uh, intellectual property right 
Um, and even though patents existed for a long time, but the focus really became very, very sharp from 1960s onwards. Um, you know, we, was, we were made to sign all kinds of agreements. Um, trips came up in the, in the late 1980s uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so what really triggered um, the, the nations of um, the, the so-called technologically advanced countries to really bring up patents and IPRs in the 1960s? And what really happened was the last of the colonies became free. Ghana became independent in around the uh, early 1960s, and so did many other countries. So how do, do, do advanced nations therefore continue to get disproportionate economic benefit unless the change, the way trade is engaged in, and they bring in other dimensions through which the disproportionate economic benefits can be extracted. And that's where professors were exported to India and to other countries to, to drum in the need for adhering to, to patents and to copyrights and, and so on and so forth. And, and therefore the timing is so, so suspicious. And, and, and therefore again, uh, the choice of words being digital colonization or technological colonization, because it is very closely interlinked with colonization without any of us realizing that. Everything that we are using right now in communicating between each of us, uh, be it the LED panel, be it uh, the, the communication standards, we as India do not control any of these technologies, none of these technologies, none of these standards. <clears throat> and therefore, just as industry can move away from China, even at this stage, uh, and they can they move to to Vietnam. They can move to India. Similarly, from India, tech, you know, uh, technology-driven uh, manufacturing can move out because we don't control these uh, technologies. And therefore, coming back to this particular slide, local industry will suffer if we don't have control over technology. Digital divide will increase. You know, we teach our our children to use proprietary software, and we say when you need to become um, uh, educated in computers. You need to learn Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint um, when there is open source available. And, and the tragedy is that uh, these are children in India who actually, to save two rupees, travel 10 kilometers and walk down 10 kilometers because they want to save two rupees in the bus fare. And, uh, and to them, we are telling, unless you use Microsoft or some such branded solution, you're not computer educated. And if you steal it, then you're in, indulging in piracy. Whereas for all the commodity basic technological solutions, we should have actually given them open source solutions which are freely available, but we have not done it. We have actually ingrained this into our curriculum that we must use proprietary software, even for education, which essentially turns us into a bus driver or a truck driver who can never build the truck, but we can only drive the truck. And therefore the amount of knowledge that is provided or that is leaked out is enough for us to be able to provide disproportionate economic benefit to somebody else, but not be able to rebuild it on our own. So for example, if you want to support, let's say the Santali language in any of the proprietary software, you will again have to, to kneel down in front of these companies and beg them and say, hey, there are 50,000 speakers of Santali, can you please support it? And the response will be, well, um, economically it does not make sense to us, so we'll not support it unless you pay us an arm and a leg to, to do that support. And therefore that leads to what we are calling as loss of technological sovereignty. We cannot define the future of our own people. We cannot define how they live, how they interact and how they work with each other to the extent that um, you know, when it came out that Zoom was actually uh, rerouting the, the data through, through China and there were serious privacy concerns with the way Zoom has been uh, providing its software India could not respond. We realized there was an issue, but what is the alternative? We don't own anything. We don't have anything that, that is a commodity technology out there. And therefore, how is US responding? You know, with, the, with China coming back as one of the technology leaders, now US actually from 2017 onwards has come back. And if you see on the left-hand side of uh, the news articles, uh, it says that only by continuing to innovate at the cutting edge will the United States be able to mitigate the threat posed by Chinese industrial policy and strengthen the US economy. And there's industrial policy on technology. For a decade and a half, China has relentlessly and doggedly pursued technological leadership while India has been on the sidelines and, uh, and, and now US is responding to it. And uh, as recent as 2019, October, uh, the Trump government reconstituted the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology 
so that they can they are able to respond to the threat what they perceive as a threat from china in a much more uh, focused manner and therefore you will see issues like um, there's a ban on uh, android being used by huawei right it came out of directly these policies that are out there and um, and uh, and how did huawei respond to it huawei has gone ahead and created their own operating system which i'm sure with the support of the chinese government may soon big start rivaling the existing operating systems of ios and android and and that's how the global trade regime is getting reshaped based on the underlying technologies that is driving the trade regime here is a, a screenshot uh, that i had taken again way back in 2007 when i was trying to convince the indian government that uh, there is a huge threat coming in because we are not focusing on uh, leadership in technology and that still holds true and this is again as i'm underlining a 15 20 year effort by the chinese government to take leadership and what is true in 2007 continues to be true in 2020 and that's a sad part so what is the implication of techno of not having technological sovereignty <clears throat> i don't know how many of you are aware that there was a nuclear bombing uh, there was a, actually a cyber bombing of the nuclear facilities of uh, of iran um in in uh, early 2002 um now uh, so this this um uh, what what this nuclear bombing did essentially uh, or the cyber uh, bombing of the nuclear facilities was it took control over the centrifuges of iran and made it uh, spin so much faster that it self destroyed itself and the entire nuclear capability of iran was brought down by at least 10 years and this was possible because the nations who were involved had control over the technology and in, and iran could do nothing about it it was not a uh, uh, an attack which happened over the internet it happened over unconnected systems and that was the sophistication of uh, of the cyber attack that happened and the impact on military strategy is the same as the impact of the nuclear bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki in august 6 and august 9 to 1945 it was a wake up call that the damage that cyber warfare and cyber bombing could do to countries who do not have technological sovereignty uh, became came to the forefront and if you look at traditional warfare you know you need to um, impact a certain um, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a, a target you simply go and bomb it as the uh, traditional military impact and that has got collateral damage civilians dying and so on and so forth and there's a huge backlash that happens from um, the global press globally in a tech controlled warfare you can fiddle around with the signaling which you can lead to a you know trains crashing but since there is no um, uh, knowledge of of the identity of the attacker so the impact of that uh, or the or the pushback of that is very very limited so you can do the damage in a focused manner while not really having a pushback on it and that's exactly what happened with the cyber bombing of uh, of uh, tehran uh, and there's a picture of um, you know another incident that happened uh, with the islamic world where um, uh, a, a video was made of um, uh, the prophet uh, by uh, by somebody in uh, uh, in los angeles and that that led to uh, riots all over the world it led to in fact five people getting killed in up it led to the lynching of the us ambassador in libya and that was the fall fall out of that little video being made but on the other hand for the entire cyber bombing of iran's uh, nuclear centrifuges there was no such fall out that happened there was no such protests there was no such riots that happened and that is the difference between a technologically uh, enabled warfare versus the the traditional mechanism of doing warfare and that is where if we do not have control over technology we are left behind not just in terms of economy and industry but also in terms of defending our own country and um, i'm picking up this little movie from from way back in 2007 which was at that time supposedly a science fiction movie which showed how a group of terrorists actually controlled uh, got control of a city and uh, when i used to go around um, talking about the policy changes needed again in 2007 i was just um, dismissed off at that time saying i'm being uh a uh, very very uh, futuristic and this is not going to happen uh and um 
uh, and the fact of the matter is it was happening even way back in 2007 even though this movie is futuristic uh, uh, as per 2007 but the reality was in 2007 also we were getting attacks uh, based on information uh, systems being hacked and and based on the fact that we did not have control over technology and therefore warfare has essentially moved into other means of um, of uh, uh, of war which is uh, cyber warfare, economic warfare, food security, and so on and so forth. And each of them has got an underlying layer of technology, which if we do not control, we will be at the receiving end. And um, as I mentioned, US has been using its control over technology again and again. Uh, if you recollect um, US forced PayPal to ban money transfer to WikiLeaks, same was done by, by Visa and MasterCard. So imagine if India is involved in a tactical situation in one of the borders and suddenly the US government, because of its uh, sudden dislike to India, says that Visa and MasterCard and all of the payment mechanisms should not be supporting India anymore. So while our military is in um, the border areas, uh, our supply chain suddenly vanishes because uh, a large part of our economy is now driven by e-commerce. It's driven by uh, internet-based payments. And if we don't have Visa, MasterCard, and other cars supporting us, our economy will come down to its knees, which is where Government of India went ahead and created the Rupee credit card, which uh, is not under the Patriot Act of the US government, whereas, a U whereas Visa and MasterCard and PayPal and so on is actually under the Patriot Act of the US government, which can dictate these companies to behave in whichever way uh, the government of US suits it to be beneficial for the US government. And therefore, again, Another dimension where lack of technology uh, severely impacts our ability to be a sovereign nation. And if you look at our payment system, you know, Google Pay, Phone Pay, Amazon Pay, Paytm, who are the largest investors in, in, in each of them? They're all either American companies or Chinese companies. But the payment firms such as Zoop.cash, which is what I'm involved with, which are purely Indian, but you will not hear about them because they will not have the kind of capital that a Google Pay or a Phone Pay or Paytm Amazon will have which were funded by large players in China and in uh, in, in US. In fact, wherever um, uh, the Chinese players cannot get in with their payment system, such as Canada and Japan, um, Paytm is put in because, um, because the Chinese companies are not allowed and they therefore become a proxy to the Chinese companies. And clearly that is not something which is good for the nation from a sovereignty perspective. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going a little quicker. Uh, these are essentially our policy battles that we had taken up again uh, since the last 13 years. This again is from 2008, 2009, where we were pushing the government to adopt open standards. Uh, and that brings me to the end of uh, this discussion today uh, with this poem from Ravindra Tagore that Atul started off this, uh, this session with, which starts by saying, where the mind is without fear and the head is at high, where knowledge is free. Unless knowledge is free, which means we've got control over our technologies, like we, we used to do um, during the time when we controlled the, the zinc technology and many other such technologies, unless we do that, we will not be a free country, we will not have free trade, we will not have control over our own destiny, and we will not be able to uh, in, improve the lives of our citizens. And, uh, and, and that's the heaven of freedom that Ramana Tagore wanted our country to awaken to. So thank you so much for um, listening to this uh, talk today. It was an absolute pleasure for me. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand the session back to Atul. Thank you, Jajit. What a fascinating journey you took us through. Uh, I mean, probably there's a lot of role that many of us have as universities, as uh, research centers to actually help India. Uh, it's not just digital, but it's, I think, also now in the new COVID world. Uh, it's about biotechnology. It's about other forms of science. Uh, of course, it converges. Uh, digital and medicine starts converging. But I, I, I was getting sort of uh, jitters as I was thinking about it. But but a couple of questions were coming to my mind, Jajit. One is, I remember there used to be an initiative by the government of India on Sam Petroda ran that called CDOT. We were trying to make our own telecom equipment and a lot of uh, excitement about it during Rajiv Gandhi's regime. And somewhere it just went, what happened? Uh, what's, your, what's the story behind that? 
So Atul, as I was mentioning, uh, that was not the only one. Uh, we have had a series of initiatives where we were very close to having leadership in technology, and um, we could just not achieve it for whatever reason. Um, we were able to build a 2G network and have the testing done in Bayroli in Delhi, uh, even when Huawei was in its diapers. Huawei was not even around at that time. And we actually built that technology under CDOT. And for whatever reason, that did not happen. That did not work out. If you look at uh, some of our other strategic initiatives, you know, when we look at Park, um, which was championed by uh, Homi Baba, um, he died an unnatural death. And we have had cases after cases where we have had unnatural deaths or cases being filed against our top scientists. Uh, one of the, the recent ones being the famous case being filed on uh, our, uh, our rocket scientist who was one of the leaders in creating um, cryogenic engines. And we lost 10 years because the police and everybody else was hounding him. Uh, and, and I will not take the names, but I think it's very clear as to who we are talking about. Uh, and we were delayed by 10 years in coming out with our own uh, uh, cyber engines, our uh, cryogenic engines. Uh, so this has been happening again and again. You know, we have had a case where another top scientist uh, of ISRO gets um, uh, hit by a truck in an empty road in, um, in one of the facilities. Uh, this happened with, uh, in fact, television production. When we, we were the leaders in television production in Asia, uh, television production, in fact, was almost a cottage industry. And we had brands like ECTV, and we had uh, Salora, and so on and so forth. And, I remember uh, Uptron you know, was there, and yeah, Uptron so many and of them. Western, and so on. And uh, they were all based on CD Pilani technology again. And in fact, the first television in Indira Gandhi's house was based on CD Pilani technology. Uh, and uh, the people who created that in CD Pilani actually went and requested the government that can they actually give some more funds to have to build a color television, because these were all black and white televisions. And in around 1979, uh, they were told that no, um, uh, India does not need color television. And uh, guess what? In two years time, uh, Asian games came in and color television was introduced. And the Indian in industry was just not ready. We did not have the technology. And all of these brands got wiped out. In fact, the younger generation would not even remember these brands that they existed. And they got all, all got wiped out because we were not allowed to build the color television. And if you could guess how much was actually asked for at that point in time, it was 1 lakh 7,000 rupees that was asked for to build this technology. And uh, because there was nothing else to do, the team which actually had the technology then dissipated. They went and joined other places because they needed a, a, a roadmap of building up cutting edge technologies to keep them interested. And if they can't do that, they will go back and do other things because technology is not something you write in a book and you open the book and you get technology. Technology is a set of people who have the knowledge and the ecosystem around that which, which produces uh, the components that that helps in building up the of that piece of technology, and if that disappears, then you don't have technology. Wow, uh, Arvind is asking. Arvind Nanda is asking a couple of questions over here. He's saying, so how do we avoid digital slavery, and how do we become a digitally sovereign state? Actually, how do we build leadership in uh, in technology? I think the first thing we need to really um, acknowledge is that uh, we do not have technology leadership and that we can achieve technology leadership. Uh, every time we have this discussion, what comes back is either fantastic futuristic technologies like let's jump into quantum computing. Um, whereas what is really needed is an ability to get into technologies where an ecosystem and an industry can be built, which then supports and funds and fuels for the development of technology. Now, I'm not saying that we should not have quantum uh, computing that is needed. But my, my, my point that I'm trying to drive is that we need to focus on uh, a set of technologies which then defines uh, how the next generation of industries will be created. To take an example, Korea, for example, never actually built ships for the last uh, thousands of years. They never had uh, you know, large ships being built. But they decided that they will be one of the largest shipbuilding entities in the world. And once they decided, they ended up being so. So now Korea produces everything from chips to ships. Whereas they were unknown even 50 years back of, of, of producing any of these uh, things from chips or ships. Uh, and therefore having the strategic intent is the first thing that is important to be done. And then rallying the right kind of industries in India to be able to then start producing the components and the, the finished products and to be able to have the ecosystem which can then support that. 
um, in the in the last four or five years, you know, India as a country has been able to actually change its policies and and get a lot of electronics manufacturing coming to India. But we are not restricted to only electronics where that we're talking about. When we talk about technology, it's not just electronics; it's pharmaceuticals, it's APIs, it's it's everything that is fundamental to a modern life that we're talking about, where we are dependent on some other country. So we need to first recognize that we do not have control over these technologies, and then we come out with detailed uh, roadmaps of how we get uh, a leadership in each one of these technologies. There is no hand waving answer. There is no one magic bullet that can be rolled out. But to having to, but to have a focus team like what US has in terms of Semtec, or like what Europe has in terms of IMEC, like what Japan has, Korea has, Taiwan has. Every country has its focus bodies. Which actually, um, you know, lives and breathes and and dreams and works only on the issue of trying to get technology leadership. Unfortunately, India does not have such a group. Uh, there was something called technology group that was recently created uh, in the last two three months. I'm not entirely familiar with what the agenda and or the charter of that group is. But it has to be beyond just plain science and technology. It has to be. It it has to be beyond the laboratory. It has to be driven by commercial interests. Uh, and should be driven by by industry bodies and commercial bodies, and technology comes post that, uh, and that's a change we really need to have in order to be able to get leadership in technology in this country. So you know the, the recent talks about Facebook and a bunch of other Americans picking up very large stakes in in Geo, and uh, that was probably the last Indian so-called global company, large company. What's your view on that, Jaijit? Is that a move which we will regret later on? Facebook coming in and acquiring Geo. So, um, look from a technology perspective, and I would like to limit our conversation to only technology. Uh, Geo did not really have any fundamental technology. Uh, it's a service provider, like many other service providers, like Airtel, like um, you know, you have uh, T-Mobile and so on and so forth. They really do not have any fundamental technology. They have a lot of market access, right? And they have the ability to uh, let digital technologies be penetrated and used by a large number of people. In fact, India is a home to most users of most apps in the world. Uh, most of the leading apps have got a large number, if not a majority, of the users coming from India. So they derive their value from India. So it's more from a value perspective and a commercial perspective that uh, you know your question needs to be looked at. But from a pure technology perspective, we don't lose anything from that deal. But we last we start losing when a core technology company is taken over. Um, you know, for example, the same thing happens with Israel. Where they come out with core technology companies, which are then bought out by largely the American companies, and at some point in time, Israel had this question that why are we giving them tax breaks when they actually end up being becoming American companies or European companies and so on. Then they came out with the policy that look, Israel is not big enough to support any of these new uh, technologies and the technology companies, and therefore we'll keep creating new technologies. And that was a viewpoint that they have taken. But India is a large market where we can actually sustain new technologies. And and have a market which can actually fuel these new technologies, and therefore we need to be careful about technology companies. Uh, when we start counting the number of uh, core technology companies we have in India, that's very very minimal, unfortunately, given the size of the economy. Not that there aren't, there are quite a few, but given the size of our economy, we have got very few technological companies who actually own core technologies. Uh, and, and therefore, coming back to your question, uh, Atul, that. Um, what is the impact of uh, facebook picking up a stake in in uh, geo that to a minority stake it's a, it's not a significant stake because it's less than 10% from a technology leadership perspective it really does not have much of an impact got it uh, you know i'm i'm uh, i remind remind myself i am uh, just thinking about when i went to china uh, google didn't work over there whatsapp doesn't work over there so starting to make sense now you know why they have baidu and why they have uh, wechat and other forms rather than the american uh, technological social media platforms i also shudder you know there's so much power with let's say a whatsapp they want to create a civil war in the country all they have to do is send a few tweets here and there so you're absolutely right atul because um, narratives being a powerful weapon of warfare has been uh, uh, a very old game um and i have been uh, you know uh, calling the 1857 uh, war of independence in india also being fueled by narrative war because um uh, it uh, started by people spreading the rumors that um, the cartridges were laced with the uh, pictalo and cautalo 
uh, and the mighty British Empire would not be as stupid as putting in cow tallow and and uh, and pig tallow on something that they know will have an impact. Um, uh, and there is no evidence at all, no documentary evidence that such a thing happened. Now, clearly, there was a narrative war which that was spread, which then galvanized this nation to actually uh, come out with the with the first war of independence in 1857. Now, with digital technologies coming in, those narrative wars are becoming accelerated and massively amplified. So what would have spread from word of mouth and would take a couple of months to spread is now happening overnight. And therefore, Atul, as you rightly said, these can be used to even topple regimes uh, and, and or have uh, internal uh, civil strife. And we have seen that happening. We have seen how uh, there have been a strife created in Bangalore where uh, Northeasterners were suddenly targeted on social media through narrative without really nothing happening on the ground. Uh, and we have seen that happening again and again, uh, where messaging systems such as WhatsApp has been misused to amplify rumors which uh, simply had no basis. Uh, and, and therefore, it's a huge threat, absolutely, Atul. It's a huge threat for the nation. So one question from Jyoti Joseph. Uh, she's asking that, uh, I'm a little confused while you're talking about uh, Americans or the Chinese controlling technology. What about the trend in technology to promote open source? and shedding as well. Uh, you've got APIs. Is that not happening or it's too small? Uh, it is happening and it's happening on uh, on systems. And that's exactly uh, you know what we're trying to promote. Uh, because we are not a technology leader, we want to promote uh, open source and open standards. But that's not really happening in most uh, systems. Uh, the code is being controlled and the APIs are being provided so that you can start using the code and provide economic benefits to somebody else. Uh, and, and the test of that is what is the profitability of various companies that are actually controlling the technologies? Between Google, Facebook, and Apple, their total valuation is more than the GDP of India. Uh, is, is that something uh, which does which makes any sense? I mean, just three companies having a, a valuation which is larger than the GDP of a, a nation which has got 16% of the global population? Clearly, something is going wrong. Clearly, we are working for somebody else and they are deriving that, that benefit. And, uh, and, and, and therefore APIs are clearly now being used more to uh, expand the rate at which consumption of these digital technologies can be made. And we end up willy-nilly paying for it. Uh, why I'm saying willy-nilly is that uh, even if you're not paying it upfront, if you're buying something, for example, if you bought a DVD player in the early 2000s, then we would end up paying the $20 royalty to somebody else, uh, which goes through the manufacturer. So willingly, we end up paying uh, a, a disproportionate economic benefit to somebody who has innovated only once and then is getting this unfair rent from this ecosystem and using that to build the so-called quote-unquote next version of the technology, which is then thrust down our throat. So I'll take two more questions. We are running out short of time uh, over here, Jaijit. Uh, Rishabh is asking, any update on GPS technology and uh, video conferencing technology that India will own? What are your views? Is it happening or will we still have to sort so, of uh, so very good be reliant? Question. Very good question. So uh, I think uh, some of us will be aware that during the Cargill war, we uh, did not get access to accurate uh, GPS signals and also some of the mapping software that the army had bought. Uh, we were denied access to the software because the fine print said that we cannot use those mapping softwares during uh, times of conflict. So I don't know what it was supposed to be used for otherwise. So that was a wake-up call for India, the Cargill War, and we started building up our own uh, navigation system, the, the global navigation system, which is now called NAVIC. Now the satellites have gone up, but we have not been able to build the processor. Uh, we got embroiled in our procurement process for the innovation. And, um, uh, and when somebody builds a processor for the first time, it costs more than the commodity processor that exists out there. So the Navi processor that was getting, uh, that was on the table was costing about $8 compared to a regular GPS processor uh, costing about $1. And therefore, if your phones don't adopt a $8 processor compared to a $1 processor, therefore your technology will never become commercial. And therefore the Navi system will not get uh, adopted by a, a large number of people in India. Now the Navic system is extremely critical from a defense perspective also, because if you're using somebody else's location system, uh, then there is a possibility that your adversary also gets to know where your troops are. And therefore you, you do need to use your own location system. But unfortunately we haven't been able to build it up. 
Um, uh, one of the Canadian companies has gone ahead and built up the processor for us. Uh, I guess we'll start with that, but these are the challenges of actually having control of our own technology. We have been able to orchestrate the satellite part of it, but we were got we got stuck on the processor part of it. Uh, well, I and- hope that's sorted out. Uh, uh, one question from Jagannath and then one from me and we close. Uh, Jagannath is asking, you know, we're talking about uh, 4.0 ML and AI, but how do we build this without access to 5G technology? Um, there are actually two different things. Uh, you know, you can still have uh, machine la- learning and you have um, uh, AI without using 5G. 5G essentially, you know, brings in the power of, uh, of massive connectivity and therefore you can actually start using phones uh, which are much cheaper because you don't need the processing power because that can be actually be done in the backend through 5G networks. Um, but the assumption that uh, we do not have access to 5G uh, is not a correct assumption. We should be able to fix that. We should be able to get control over 5G technologies. Uh, we have been talking about it for uh, ages that we should jump in and start investing on the next generation of technologies. Uh, that's what China did. China has got a uh, a stranglehold of uh, on both 4G and 5G, uh, and uh, and not that it matters to us because we never control over it even earlier. It was um, the Ericsson's and Nokia's and, and the U.S. companies which had control. Now the control is uh, is being shared between uh, China and and the other companies. Uh, we need to start getting control over some of these technologies because it will become fundamental. Uh, and um, and look, uh, the other other point is that who is telling us that we need 5G right now uh, when the balance sheets of the telecom companies are absolutely stretched? Uh, we are not getting good connectivity even with the existing investments that we have. And suddenly we want to invest more and try to bring in a, a fast connectivity to a few people in a few cities um, while you know stretching the balance sheets of our telecom companies. Uh, I think we need to do a rethink of when we allow the next set of technologies to come in. And I'm not being, uh, I'm not saying that they should be postponed, sign and die, or we should be having an ambassador car kind of a moment where we never allow technology to come in. But we can always have a one-year, two-year pause so that we get enough um, uh, uh, breathing power to our local companies and our local ecosystem so that we can align to therefore get a larger share of whatever market gets created from the domestic markets. Now, this is so wonderful. And uh, I so wish Mr. Modi, Mr. Ambani, and Mr. Tata were listening to you. Uh, I think I so wish that uh, you can present these views to them, Jajit, uh, which I'm sure you already have. Uh, but one thought com- was coming to my mind, which is uh, Gandhiji's whole thought about Swaraj, where somewhere I think he had these perspectives also. So probably we had people at that point of time thinking about these issues, which we are not at the moment. So uh, before we close, uh, last uh, one minute of summary and last minute of thoughts, and we'll then call it today. Yeah, no, Atul, you're absolutely right in the last observation. Uh, somehow, indigenization and self-reliance became uh, went out of fashion. Uh, they would look down upon uh, on as being, uh, uh, on being having a closed thought process of not being open to the world. And I think, again, that was part of the narrative warfare that uh, happened. Um, when we were going and asking in early 2000 that shouldn't we have our own telecom equipment, uh, we were told, uh, and this was parroting of whatever the global institutions were saying, that there will be more benefit by simply rolling out the telecom infrastructure than waiting to develop our own telecom industry and, and our ability to manufacture telecom equipment locally. Uh, and that the multiplier effect will uh, take care of any other loss that we may have by not having manufacturing in India. And those are narratives that are formulated and fed in through various mechanisms, through you know, so-called research papers, through um, uh, you know, sessions and forums and, uh, uh, and uh, white papers uh, and one-on-one interactions with uh, the policymakers. And the policymakers actually believe in those narratives. Uh, it's only after you know 15, 20 years that uh, that people come back and realize that they made a mistake, and uh, I don't, uh, and, and none of us want to be in a situation where we say, "Hey, I told you so." Uh, it doesn't help. Uh, we did tell them at that time, but it doesn't help. Uh, and I think at least now, after so many years, we should start having a very sharp focus in being able to get control of some of the critical technologies as well as the commodity technologies. Commodity technologies such as 
uh, web conferencing, like the one that we're using, commodity technologies such as word processing, commodity technologies such as phones that every one of us use, IOTs, sensors, and so on and so forth. Because these are technologies which, if they fall under the wrong hands, can then be used and and to be to to be used to unleash massive destruction in this country because they touch every single citizen in this country, and therefore every single citizen can actually be manipulated. In fact, uh, in 2012, I held a, held a session on e-politics where I was predicting that um, social media and uh, and the phones and the technologies that we have will soon be used to actually control the mind of people so that they start voting in a particular manner. And unfortunately, that's what actually happened with that Cambridge Analytica uh, fiasco. And that's not the last of the uh, of the happenings in the world. There'll be more such things that will happen as we move forward if we do not have control over these technologies. Thank you, Jayjit. I so wish we had more time. Lots of thanks coming in over here. Uh, I think it's a wake up call for research institutions like Shulani and others to start working on new technologies, working on new research, especially research that's, that provides value to the community that makes us self-aligned. So I assure you that we'll do a research meeting at Shulani and make sure that uh, whatever little we can contribute to this effort, we'll do that. With that, we come to an end of a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Jayjit Bhattacharya. Uh, what a fascinating talk. I hope uh, coronavirus gets over soon and we can see you in person over here. I also picked up zap.com, uh, zap.cash actually. So I'm going to put in a proposal to our CFO to look at uh, using zap.cash, something that you're driving very passionately uh, apart from you know, the Paytm and the other initiatives that we have. Uh, but once again, thank you very much, Ajit. And on behalf of everyone, uh, including the participants, I thank all of you you. We'll see you again tomorrow at the same time, 11.30 on the Yogananda Guru series. This time, we're going to move from technology and science to dramatics. So tomorrow, the theme is going to be theater and drama. So please join us 11.30 tomorrow a.m. on the Yogananda Guru series. Thank you once again, Jayajit. Thank you once again, all the participants. Uh, I could see lots of interaction both on YouTube and Zoom. Truly appreciate that. Have a great day and be safe. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.